and I have a, you know, a step function level increase in that compared to everybody else, then that gives me infinite power to undermine and outcompete all businesses. If I have a super programmer, then I can outcompete programming. 70 to 90% of the code written at today's AI labs is written by AI. <laughs> Thinking about the stock market as well. Thinking about the stock market. If I have an AI that can trade in the stock market better than all the other AIs, because they're currently there's mostly AIs that are actually trading on the stock market, but if I have a jump in that, then I can consolidate all the wealth. If I have an AI that can do cyber hacking, that's way better at cyber hacking and a step function above what everyone else can do, then I have an asymmetric advantage over everybody else. So AI is like a power pump. It pumps economic advantage, it pumps scientific advantage, and it pumps military advantage, which is why the countries and the companies are caught in what they believe is a race to get there first. And anything that is a negative consequence of that, job loss, rising energy prices, more emissions, stealing intellectual property, you know, security risks, all of that stuff feels small relative to if I don't get there first, then some other person who has less good values as me, they'll get AGI and then I will be forever a slave to their future. And I know this might sound crazy to a lot of people, but this is how people in at the very top of the AGI AI world believe is currently happening. And, and that's what just justified. conversations. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've, you've had, I mean, you know, Jeff Hinton and, and uh, Roman Yomplonsky on and, and other people, Mogadot, and they're saying the same thing. And I think people need to take seriously that whether you believe it or not, the people who are currently deploying the trillions of dollars, this is what they believe. And they believe that it's winner take all. And it's not just first solve intelligence and use that to solve everything else. It's first dominate intelligence and use that to dominate everything else. Have you had concerning private conversations about this subject matter with people that are in the industry? Absolutely. I think that's what most people don't understand is that um, there's a different conversation happening publicly than the one that's happening privately. I think you're aware of this as well. I am aware of this. What do they say to you? <laughs> so it's not always the people telling me directly. It's usually one step removed. So it's usually someone that I trust and I've known for many, many years who at a kitchen table says, I met this particular CEO. We were in this room talking about the future of AI. This particular CEO they're referencing is leading one of the biggest AI companies in the world. And then they'll explain to me what they think of the future is going to look like. And then when I go and watch them on YouTube or podcasts, what they're saying is they, they have this real public bias towards the abundance part, the, you know, we're going to cure cancer. Cure cancer, universal high income for everyone. Um, yeah, all this, all this stuff that kind of sounds work good. Anymore. But then privately what I hear is, is exactly what you said which is really terrifying to me. There was actually since, since the last time we had a conversation about AI on this podcast, I was speaking to a friend of mine, very successful billionaire, knows a lot of these people. And he is concerned because his argument is that if there's even like a, a 5% chance of the adverse outcomes that we hear about, we should not be doing this. And he was saying to me that some of his friends who are running some of these companies believe the chance is much higher than that, but they feel like they're caught in a race where yes. if they don't control this technology and they don't get there first and get to what they refer to as um, takeoff, like fast takeoff. Yeah, uh, recursive self-improvement or fast takeoff, which basically means what the companies are really in a race for, you're pointing to, is they're in a race to automate AI research. Um, because so right now, you have OpenAI, it's got a few thousand employees. Human beings are coding and doing the AI research. They're reading the latest research papers, they're writing the next, you know, they're hypothesizing what's the improvement we're gonna make to AI, what's a new way to do this code, what's a new technique. And then they use their human mind and they go invent something, they, they run the experiment and they see if that improves the performance. And that's how you go from, you know, GPT-4 to GPT-5 or something. Imagine a world where Sam Altman can, instead of having human AI researchers, can have AI AI researchers. So now I just snap my fingers and I go from one AI that reads all the papers, writes all the code, creates the new experiments, to I can copy paste 100 million AI researchers that are now doing that in an automated way. And it, the belief is not just that, you know, the companies look like they're competing to release better chatbots for people, but they're, what they're really competing for is to get to this milestone of being to automate an intelligence explosion or automate recursive self-improvement, which is basically automating AI research. And that, by the way, is why all the companies are racing specifically to get good at programming. Because the faster you can automate a human programmer, 
the more you can automate AI research. And just a couple weeks ago, Claude 4.5 was released, and it can do 30 hours of uninterrupted complex programming tasks at the, at the high end. That's crazy. So right now, one of the limits on the progress of AI is that human, humans are doing the work. Yes. But actually, all of these companies are pushing to the moment when AI will be doing the work, which means they can have an infinite, arguably smarter, zero-cost workforce That's right. scaling the AI. So when they talk about fast takeoff, they mean the moment where, they, where the AI takes control of the research and, it, and progress rapidly increases. And it self-learns and recursively improves and invents. Um, so one thing to get is that AI accelerates AI, right? Like, if I invent nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons don't invent better nuclear weapons. Yeah. But if I invent AI, AI is intelligence. Intelligence automates better programming, better chip design. So I can use AI to say, here's a design for the NVIDIA chips. Go make it 50% more efficient, and it can find out how to do that. I can say, AI, here's a supply chain that I need for all the things for my AI company. And it can optimize that supply chain and make that supply chain more efficient. Mm -hmm. AI, here's the code for making AI. Make that more efficient. Um, AI, here's training data. I need to make more training data. Go, go run a million simulations of how to do this, and it'll train itself to get better. What so do you think AI accelerates AI. What do you think these people are motivated by, the CEOs of these companies? <sighs> That's a good question. Genuinely, what do you think their genuine motivations are? When you think about all these names. I think it's a subtle thing. I think there's, um, it's almost mythological because there's almost a way in which they're building a new intelligent entity that has never before existed on planet Earth. It's like building a god. I mean, the incentive is build a god, own the world economy, and make trillions of dollars. Right? If you could actually build something that can automate all intelligent tasks, all goal achieving, that will let you outcompete everything. So that is a kind of godlike power that I think relative, imagine energy prices go up or hundreds of millions of people lose their jobs. That, those things suck. But relative to if I don't build it first and build this god, I'm going to lose to some maybe worse person who I think, in my opinion, not my opinion, Tristan, but their opinion thinks is a worse person. It's, it's a kind of competitive logic that self-reinforces itself. But it forces everyone to be incentivized to take the most shortcuts, to care the least about safety or security, to not care about how many jobs get disrupted, to not care about the well-being of regular people, but to basically just race to this infinite prize. So there's a quote that um, a friend of mine interviewed a lot of the top people at the AI companies, like the very top. And he just came back from that and, and basically reported back to me and some friends. And he said the following, in the end, a lot of the tech people I talk to, when, I'm, when I really grill them on it about like why you're doing this, they retreat into number one, determinism. Number two, the inevitable replacement of biological life with digital life. And number three, that being a good thing anyways. At its core, it's an emotional desire to meet and speak to the most intelligent entity that they've ever met. And they have some ego-religious intuition that they'll somehow be a part of it. It's thrilling to start an exciting fire. They feel they'll die either way, so they prefer to light it and see what happens. That is the perfect description of the private conversations. Doesn't that match what, what that's you the have? Perfect description. Doesn't it? And that's the thing. So people may hear that and they're like, well, that sounds ridiculous. But if you actually. I just got goosebumps because <laughs> it's the perfect description, especially the part they'll think they'll die either way. Exactly. Well, and um, worse than that, <laughs> Some of them think that in the case where they, if they were to get it right, and if they succeeded, they could actually live forever. Because if AI perfectly speaks the language of biology, it will be able to reverse aging, aging cure every disease. And, and so there's this kind of, I could become a god. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, you, know, you and I both have know people who've had private conversations. Well, one of them that I have heard from one of the co-founders of one of the most com you know, powerful of these companies, when when faced with the idea that what if there's an 80% or 20% chance that everybody dies and gets wiped out by this, but an 80% chance that we get utopia, he said, well, I would clearly accelerate and go for the utopia. Given a 20% chance. It's crazy. People should feel, you do not get to make that choice on behalf of me and my family. We didn't consent to have six people make that decision on behalf of 8 billion people. 
We have to stop pretending that this is okay or normal. It's not normal. And the only way that this is happening and they're getting away with it is because most people just don't really know what's going on. Yeah. But I'm curious, what, what do you think when I... It's, I mean, everything you just said. It's, uh, the, the last part about the 80-20% thing is almost verbatim what I heard from a very good, very successful friend of mine who is responsible for building some of the biggest companies in the world when he was referencing a conversation he had with the founder of maybe the biggest AI company in the world. And it was truly shocking to me because, <clears throat> because, because it was said in such a blasé way. Yes. It wasn't, yeah, that, that's what I had heard in this particular situation. It wasn't like... It, it was like it matter was just, of fact. It's just a matter of fact. It's just easy. Yeah, of course I would do the, I would take the, I would roll the dice. And even Elon Musk said, he actually said the same number in an interview with Joe Rogan. Um, and if you listen closely when he said, I decided I'd rather be there when it all happens, if it all goes off the rails, I decided in that worst case scenario, I decided that I'd, I'd prefer to be there when it happens. Which it's, is just, it's just justifying racing to our collective suicide. Now, I also want people to know, like, you don't have to buy into the sci-fi level risks to be very concerned about AI. So hopefully later we'll talk about um, the many other risks that are already hitting us right now that you don't have to believe any of this stuff. Yeah, the, the Elon thing I think is particularly interesting because for the last 10 years, he was this slightly hard to believe voice on the subject of AI. He was talking about it being a huge risk yeah. and an extinction level. He was, level he was the first he AI was risk the people. Yeah, he was yeah. saying, this is more dangerous than nukes. He yeah. was saying, I try to get people to stop doing it. This is summoning the demon. Those are his words, not mine. Yeah. Um, we shouldn't do this. Supposedly, he used his first and only meeting with President Obama, I think in 2016, to advocate for global regulation and global controls on, on AI um, because he was very worried about it. And then really what happened is um, ChatGPT came out and as you said, that was the starting gun. And now everybody was in an all-out race to get there first. He tweeted words to the effect, I'll put it on the screen. He tweeted that he had remained in, I think he used a word similar to disbelief for some time, like suspended disbelief. But then he said in the same tweet that the race is now on. The race is on, and I have to race. And I have to go. I have no choice but to go. And he tried. he's basically saying, I tried to fight it for a long time. I tried to deny it. I tried to hope that we wouldn't get here, but we're here now, so I have to go. Yep. And at least he's being honest. He does seem to have a pretty honest track record on this because, because he was the guy 10 years ago warning everybody. And I remember him talking about it and thinking, oh, God, this is like 100 years away. Why are we talking yeah, about that? I felt the same, by the way. Yeah. Some people might think that I'm some kind of AI enthusiast and I'm trying to ratchet. I, I didn't believe that AI was a thing to be worried about at all until suddenly the last two, three years where you can actually see where we're headed. But, um, oh, man, there's just there's so much to say about all of this. And I'm, so if you think about it from their perspective, it's like, Best case scenario, I build it first, and it's aligned and controllable, meaning that it will take the actions that I want, it won't destroy humanity, and it's controllable, which means I get to be God and emperor of the world. Second scenario, it's not controllable, but it's aligned. So I built a God and I lost control of it, but it's now basically it's running humanity, it's running the show, it's choosing what happens, it's outcompeting everyone on everything. That's not that bad an outcome. Third scenario, it's not aligned, it's not controllable, and it does wipe everybody out. And that should be demotivating to that person, to an Elon or someone. But in that scenario, they were the one that birthed the digital god that replaced all of humanity. Like, this is really important to get because in nuclear weapons, the risk of nuclear war is an omni-lose-lose outcome. Everyone wants to avoid that. And I know that you know that I know that we both want to avoid that. <laughs> So that, that motivates us to coordinate and to have a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. But with AI, the worst case scenario of everybody gets wiped out is a little bit different for the people making that decision. Because if I'm the CEO of DeepSeek and I make that AI that does wipe out humanity, and that's the worst case scenario, and it wasn't avoidable because it was all inevitable, then even though we all got wiped out, I was the one who built the digital god that replaced humanity, and there's kind of ego in that. And uh, the god that I built speaks Chinese instead of English. That's the religious ego point. That's the ego religious point. Which is such a great point, because that's exactly what it is. It's like this religious ego where I will be transcendent in some way. And you notice that it, it all starts by the belief that this is inevitable. Yeah. Which is like, is this inevitable? It's important to note, because 
if you believe it's if everybody who's building it believes it's inevitable and the investors funding it believe it's inevitable, it co-creates the inevitability. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the only way out is to step outside the logic of inevitability. Because if if we are all heading to our collective suicide, which I don't know about you, I don't think that I don't want that. You don't.